this is one of those sessions in which um, you know you ask what, what happens at 3:30 on the last day on a hot summer's conference. Um, you know, some people get to come and talk about academic part of our world, but the reality is it's actually very important. If it wasn't for the academic side of our profession, you know, we'd still be rumbling through the same old techniques and things that we're doing. And I think it's very important that even if there are some fantastic skilled innovators and surgeons out there. If you have a career where you develop the way of treating something, even if you know it to be so true to yourself, and maybe it is, if you never share that with anyone else, there's incredible disservice to the profession. You know, so as, as good as it is to be a surgeon, I think one of the better things to be is to actually be able to evolve that practice and pass it on to, to sort of the profession as a whole. And part of that then is the concept of integrating some sort of research into your clinical career. And so I'm, I'm going to start here with just talking about research in general. I'm going to talk about preparing a manuscript. Um, and as servant is Professor um, at Royal Brisbane Hospital at the University of Queensland is going to come and talk to us a little bit about publication, where you might consider publications. Very disappointing. If you write a publication, you think it's a good piece of work, and you send it somewhere like nature science or something, <laughs> It will spend about five minutes in the review pile and get rejected to you. And it's not, and one has to be very careful of being, um, what's the word, uh, uh, let down, you lose interest, uh, you get demotivated by journal, uh, journal rejections. People reject manuscripts for all sorts of reasons. The audience of the journal, the, the levels at which they expect things to be presented at, and picking the right journal is very important. And this is going to talk to us about that. So let's talk about this. To me, the pillars of academic surgical career, you know, research is always quoted there, and that's true. Education is very important. I actually really enjoy education, uh, although sometimes trainees frustrate me. Um, I, I think it's a great tool, and you, know, you pass on and see people develop during the year. But I think administration is something I desperately avoided this when I first started out. But at the end of the day, I think if you get into sort of academic career, you have to have some administrative role because you want to see the profession change. And even if that's just being a public voice and, or an advocate for your surgical group. Um, and just an example for this is, you know, like the MBS reviews that came through recently. You know, MBS suddenly put online low-value surgery. It's like tonsillectomy, surgical interventions. They wanted to review a whole lot of rhinologic codes. And if it wasn't for... What are we, how many members in our society? 500? There was about five out of 500 that went to the effort of writing re rebuttal letters and uh, sub open submissions to NBS. And, and really, if it's not for that, you know, people who have their own agendas in the public health sector would have just steamrolled over a whole lot of item numbers that we have. And, and we need it not to be. 1%, but we need it to be like 10% of our society is willing to do those things. To me, I, I love it because it, you develop a specialised surgical niche. You know, I, I acknowledge it's very hard sometimes if you're a generalist. You know, you need to know when to sort of pass things on, maybe when something's better ma managed elsewhere. Where you practice may, may change that too. You know, I, I don't... I like guys who are in more regional areas giving things a go, especially if it's not a tumour or a cancer operation, and if it doesn't work, don't worry, there's always going to be salvage. But... But being a specialist in a city gives you a very niche sort of um, procedure. I, you know, I work out, I only perform five surgical procedures. You know, it's only, I only do the same five on everyone. This is very true. William Mayo is a famous uh, Oxford uh, professor, and he said, many of us who worked in the profession for, for, the, for a long period of time, he said, well, understand that many skillful operators are not good surgeons. You can do a, the beautiful septoplasty on someone, but if your problem is all about rhinitis or some other cause of your nasal obstruction, who cares? You know? So how you select patients, pick them carefully, direct surgical to them, it's not just a technical skill. You've got to have the technical skills, but the next layer is very important. Scientific literacy, though, in Australia has changed a lot. And, and this is not just in surgery, it's in the, in the whole medical profession, profession. What is happening at a basic science level and what is actually being practiced has been a divergent pathway. So much so that our understanding of disease in some areas is almost at opposites to how it's being practiced clinically. And, and this is a real problem. And the people who have to bridge the basic science and what actually happens clinically are the ac academics. And, and the surgical 
profession here is, is a real problem because, you know, there's absolutely no surgical training in research in Australia. Uh, you know, we still, what's, uh, who's on the board, Melville and Anders? I mean, what do people have to do at the moment? They have to do a poster, don't they? A talk or a poster at a conference and that's it. That's, that's your surgical, that's your research component for training. I think it was even less. I just had to have an abstract submitted when I went through. If you compare that to places like in the US, they spend a dedicated time. They're expected to develop publications and, and produce papers. In the NHS, um, getting publications done is, is almost a, a rite of passage through. Everything from your um, medal award and your retirement depends on everything, on how much publications you put out. And everything. In Australia, there's nothing there. And, and there's no doubt it's changing. There's an MD degree now. It's off of the University of New South Wales. That the students spend a year or 36 weeks doing a dedicated research time. And so it's changing. I have to say, if you said in Australia, what, what's the killer of academic practice? It's private medicine. Is it, it? No doubt if you just do a very simple superficial equation, you use, why would you spend time doing research when you could just do a few more tonsils and then you, you're going to pay your mortgage off better and your car's going to be paid off. But I think that's a very superficial look at it. You can actually narrow down your practice and make it a more enjoyable, more efficient practice by doing some of the academic stuff. And so it's not a simple trade-off of private practice versus academics. Now the next thing I'm going to talk about is clinical research. There's two types of research. People still get this confused, I think, in my opinion. You have clinical research. This is called observational research. It's on humans, and they are the case series, case controls, Cohorts are where the population is split based on an intervention. So it's a group of people who have um, had neck cancer. Some are treated radiotherapy, some are treated surgery. It's called a cohort. It doesn't matter if it wasn't randomised or anything, but it's a cohort. A cohort against popular themes does not term just a, a group of people going through. A, a cohort of patients who had septoplasty and I measured their SNOT scores before and after. It's not a cohort. That's called a case series. It's not controlled. There's no two populations. It's called a single cohort. Studies traditionally are controlled cohort. Using the words controlled cohort is about the same as saying a prospective randomised trial. They, they're almost double entendres. Because if you have a randomised trial, you have to be prospective. How did you randomise them otherwise? So cohorts are that. But you can retrospectively look at cohorts. So a retrospective cohort might be children born with sensory neural loss. They're... Lang I'm trying out an, an ear one here for you, Melville. I didn't want to make it too run logic. Um, their language ability at 18, and you go back and look at them and you see who had early language or, or hearing interventions, such as hearing aids or cochlear implant or maybe early speech therapy, and those who didn't. And so it's still a, a group of patients, the same condition, hearing loss, at, at, at born with hearing loss, and they had different interventions, but you're now looking at their language development now. So the intervention happened a long time ago. That's a retrospective cohort. Is that a good example? Yeah, thank you. What about s studies that are done on cells and immunology and interleukins and things? This is called experimental research. And, and you don't use the words case control, cohort, controlled study. These are not. This is called experimental research. These words are for human observational research. So experimental research is all the other things we do in the lab. And you might have controls and you want to test the effect of your vehicle solution and a normal cell line and stuff, but, but it's not, it's, you don't use these terms. It's just experimental. It's very important that this is true in all of research, that intellectual technical rules is no intense of being wrong. You know, there's lots of things we did in the eyes, people who did frontal lobotomies and other sort of procedures, that they believed that what they were doing was the right thing. But time and research and scientific analysis has proven to be wrong. Oh, that's, that's another, that's a great one. Do you like the, look at the lobotomy and the hairy arm coming in? It's a bit dangerous. That doesn't look that old too, that, that picture. Why research Harvey Cushing, the famous surgeon, who said, I'd like to, be, like to see one day where somebody would be appointed surgeon who had no hands for the operative part as the least part of the work. It's a very good talk. This is the other person so that's one, that's doing the surgery and getting it right. The other person is Archie Cochrane. I have to make a mention of the Cochrane group here. Archie Cochrane was an obstetrician who could see that in prenatal birth, children who were given corticosteroids prior to the delivery, when they were in utero, 
had survival out outcomes that were much, much better for kids who weren't given the corticosteroids to help develop the lung function. And the actual symbol as part of the Cochrane group is a forest plot. So it's the analysis by these randomized studies on not some little outcome like a, you know, um, a cradle cap in neonates, but death, neonatal death, yes or no, from studies looking at whether you gave the mother's steroid beforehand. And there was a forest plot that showed that if you gave steroids from the trial, small trials, they're all small trials, unfortunately, there's no one huge trial in the world that accumulates all the research, but about 25 years prior to the last study being done, there was very good evidence that if you just gave steroids to premature mothers, the kids survived much better. And so for a quarter of a century, people were still doing trials and other things in this area. It's completely considered standard of care now. And the minute he realised that, he quit as an obstetrician. And he dedicated his life to, um, to making sure that the research that was done was translated into clinical practice. And he could actually work out the number of children who had died unnecessarily. These are not children who had genetic defects or just premature. And that's all. That's a great story, you might say, in, in obstetrics, right? But does it exist elsewhere? Yes, it does exist elsewhere. So here is another hard outcome. Perioperative deaths from antibiotic pro prophylaxis and colorectal surgery. These are all the RCTs that were done. Very good time effect for odds ratio of death, death, not wound infection, death. Once again, though, if you do the meta-analysis, this is by year now, and actually you line it up by year, you actually, there's statistical significance years and years and years before the last RCT was done to show that if you give perioperative antibiotics during colorectal surgery, you can prevent death. The same was true for GI hemorrhage. I actually remember being a general surgical registrar, and we still did all the balloons, and here was a general registrar and things. But if you look at early endoscopic intervention for death from upper GI hemorrhage, same story. These are all these randomized controlled trials, but look how quickly they became in a meta-analysis. You can actually prevent death by early endoscopic management in these patients, you know, years before the, the last study came out. Forget alone what probably was happening in many hospitals, but the last study that was done. So his thing was, it surely is a criticism of our profession that we haven't been able to summarize and organize and distribute our, our data into into pre clinical practice. Do we have any questions about that? Because I'm going to move on to then the whole thing about writing a paper. All right. Those sort of things though, are what motivate me. Yeah. If you have registers, you'll get the same effect. If you're early on to see what's going on in the community. That, that's good. You mean everyone pooling audits and, and a register. Because that, that was a, you, you come from the northern European states, which have been really big into public registers, haven't they? I think it's very true. Presenting research work, peer-reviewed manuscripts are really the sort of the top of the line. You sometimes get invited manuscripts, and even though they're peer-reviewed, it's sort of like it almost goes in underneath, you know, um, the process, and so it's not really considered uh, as good. A authored books or chapters, you can edit books. That's where someone who's got great contacts just gets a whole lot of people to write the chapters and he edits the books. It's a good thing too. It's, it's good to formulate that, that group. Um, submitted oral pre presentations um, versus invited ones, um, and then submitted posters. So let's talk about the basics. You always have the, fo the format. You can just go to the website, though, for most people, and the manuscripts should really contain something like this. Title, page, abstract, text, acknowledgement, reference tables, and figures. You start each subdivision on your page, usually define abbreviations. And there is, if you don't have a style to go from, this is the fallback. So this the AMA manual style. It's very simple. You only have to sort of just go to it occasionally to, to look at stuff. And it was a sort of an international community of medical journal edit editors. And, and the most important thing here is that don't invent something for the first time. If you're going to write a paper, it should absolutely be templated. If you have to dream up what I put in here, what I put in there, you, you're sort of doing it the wrong way. It should almost be completely templated where you can fit it in. RCTs have their own guidelines, consort, we'll talk about that later on. But you can just go to a website such as Allergy and Rhinology and you'll find here on most of them it says Author Guidelines. And if you click on it, it'll tell you the basics for that journal. And that's where you should start. You should, and it's going to tell us about how to pick the journal, but you pick the journal and that's where you start. 
If you want to know what should be in a study, anything other than an RCT, so an RCTs have their own reporting guidelines called Consort, which you should use, but there's this group called Strobe, and actually some journals now, I actually submitted recent articles to a journal where they asked me to click off a Strobe checklist for the type of study I had. So I had a cohort, and I actually had to tick off the Strobe checklist as part of my submission for it. And I think that'll become the more norm here. So if you have anything less than an RCT, except for case series, but cohorts, case controls, cross-sectional studies, you go to Strobe, you click on Strobe, they'll give you what should be the basic elements of that. And it's interesting that things that people won't think, like allocation tables, how you should lay out the methods, what's expected in, in those sort of studies. Reviews. Prisma is the style for systematic reviews. So if you're going to do a review, what's called a secondary research project. Now, secondary research is not a narrative, my opinion, or review on something. Secondary research is where you actually have a methodology. You should show someone how you went through published databases and how you selected the studies at which you included for your cumulative evidence. That has to be the whole purpose of making it systematic means that someone could look at your methodology and repeat it on their own by reading your paper and come up with the same articles. That's why it's called systematic and that's why it's, a, it's got methodology to it. Prisma is the style. Prisma is the, is the reporting and how you do it. If you ever want to know about how to do things in meta-analysis or systematic reviews, if you get the Cochrane Handbook, it's free. Narrative reviews, though, for everyone here, this is where you write an opinion with some professor or something as a world leader, and you just quote 20 papers and you're like, uh, the, you know, state of the art in stapy surgery, or bilateral compact in implant surgery. It's just an opinion. These things are generally invited. If you submit one of these to the JLO, it ain't going to be accepted unless it's coming from someone who is actually an expert in their field. Well, would you agree with that, guys? Yeah. Narrative reviews were big 20 years ago, but probably rarely accepted now or only by invite. Would you say that's probably true? Yeah. 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 No, 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 you're saying systematic review, reviews RCTs. I, I would actually disagree with that slightly. I, I agree with you. It, uh, you can do a systematic review um, of RCTs. That's the Cochrane style. Cochrane doesn't accept. It, Cochrane will do diagnostic reviews or RCTs, but they don't do lower levels of evidence. But you can still do a systematic review. Systematic only means that you're doing it in a way that's repeatable and for methodology. So there are very good examples. Cohorts are perhaps the most common one that are, are done by systematic reviews. There is The reason we don't include outside RCTs is because the bias factor becomes very large between the two groups. In the, in the cohort, you've got a control group and an intervention group. In an RCT, the bias is relatively low, and Cochrane will have a style called the Cochrane Bias Tool in which you can work out how much bias exists maybe between the, the different studies. When you get into cohorts, though, where some patients will go back to our head and neck cancer, some people got radiotherapy, some people got surgery, there'll be inherent selection biases as to who got surgery and who got radiotherapy if it's not randomised. And how you tease out comparing one study in which the selection bias because the surgical group was very skillful and another place where they didn't have surgeons and everything got, RC, everything got chemo RT and only stuff that was desperate got by, done by the surgeons becomes very difficult. But there is a thing called the Newcastle-Ottawa scale, which is a, a system of reporting bias between cohorts. Once you drop down after that, I agree with Yaki, it gets very dubious. You almost have to do what's called a case-by-case -case analysis. You essentially, if you're going to do cross-sectional studies, uh, reviews of case series, you essentially need the details of every patient within every trial so that you're, you're looking at a case record. I like to disagree with that. Yeah, sure. Okay. That's all right. You can just... Uh, I think the problem, I think in, in, in medicine, you know, if you do a randomised controlled trial, yeah. you, you take a tablet A, B, C, D, and you compare them and you say, well, which one is the same Well, it's just two different treatments. They're repeating the same treatment every time. Mm -hmm. Surgery is very 
or, or, or perhaps even collating surgical trials because you know what's being done in the surgical arm in one centre is very different from the surgical arm in another. Yeah, I, I agree. And that's the sort of bias that creeps in. No, and, that, then, and perhaps, Alki, that's not just a bias that exists from between RCTs and cohorts, but it, it's inherent in the idea of when, when someone says PJ Wormald did a sphenoethmoidectomy, you know that you know that there's not much left. But I know from the from the trials on like the uh, Propel stent that they have to go out to the and does anyone know what the Propel the intersex stent is? It's like this mimetazone stent. When they did it, they did it in the general community. The first few cases were failing and the stents were coming out because the ENT surgeons didn't make the cavity big enough even to get the stent in. And so the, the idea of being able to correlate you know, one surgical technique to another is, is so difficult there. They still call it a sphenoethmoidectomy. Yeah. So let's have a look at the basics then. Following the same format as the structured abstract, introduction methods, results, and conclusions. Now I'm just going to go through some very simple things as an editor about what I think is important in each of these things over the next sort of five or ten minutes. And it's just that you've got to define the intended audience. But, you know, in rhinology and you're submitting to allergy and rhinology, so don't write an abstract that starts with CRS is a common condition affecting 9% of the world's population. You know, it, it's like that's not required. You, you know, you can just get straight to the meat of what's, what's happening in the summary of the clinical problem. It's probably worthwhile in an introduction just to say where the deficit is. You know, a lack of understanding of such is, is, is not known in the literature. And you must say very specifically, what is the aim of the study? The study was designed to look at, you know, and you go through it. And I try to avoid the first person. I'll talk about first and second person. When a publication has a lot of first person, it's very, you know, and you read it as an editor, it almost wants it, you're almost looking to reject it because it's, uh, most people don't write in the first person in scientific literature. And we'll talk about it. So here's an example. We investigated the impact of smoking on the severity in CRS. This is, this is not a good hypothesis. I'm going to talk about where it should be changed. You might want to say, because when you say this, you're implying a direction that smoking impacts the severity, when really you want to look at the relationship between smoking and CRS. It's an hypothesis. You, you're not going into it with, ah, this is, I know what's going to be the outcome already. And really... The hypothesis should just drop the first person and should be the relationship between smoking was assessed. Yeah. That's the sort of thing in, in scientific style. When it comes to methods, this little thing, if you can remember the PICO, if you can define your population, the intervention, the comparison arm, if there was one, and the outcomes that you used and what they were is very important. We'll go through it. You must describe the study. If you can't describe it, it's very, very difficult. And then you can say, what, what population, what patients or tissues are being assessed? So, like in sinus disease, you can't just say, oh, sign your patients with sinusitis. You have to be very specific. Was it acute or chronic? Was it definition? How, you know, how did you define the groups? You know, did they have CT evidence of sinus inflammation? And then were you, was it based on symptoms or did you have CT or endoscopy findings? You know, did you confirm it with pathology as well or microbiology? Were you following an international guideline to define your group? And I'm sure the same is here. Surely, like, in ears, like, what's the definition of otosclerosis? You know, there must be, like, a... Is there, is there an international definition of otosclerosis? Again, I think these things aren't easy. Just, just don't, don't think that. Yeah, okay. The manuscript is written without the results before you start the trial, in my opinion. Or you've almost, how you do the methodology, it has to be exact. Because I agree, if you do a study, but then your definition of chronic sinus disease was not really the accepted norm, the whole project becomes junk, wouldn't you say? You know, if they, they even question whether or not the patients had sinus disease, and it's a big issue. Do you think that Yeah. It, 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 or you can always see it in a paper, yeah. 
So what patients being assessed? Children who was excluded, pregnant, chronic illness. Where were they recruited? Where were they recruited is a big issue. If you take patients from general practice, it's very different than if you take patients from a tertiary practice. And if you take sinus patients coming to my practice, they're going to be much more severe than that presenting to the general population, which makes them a skewed population, maybe not the, not the, not the sort of applicable to maybe the general person. And was consent obtained and things like that, so, and HREC approval are all now things that are demanded of journals. I mean, you cannot even publish an audit without having a consent or a, um, an HREC arrangement. You know, most consents are waived for retrospective audits, but you have to have a, at least an ethics approval. So um, let's have a look at a couple of examples. So here in the methods, it says it's a cross-sectional study. The population was defined. It said that patients with um, tertiary clinic were reviewed. CRS defined according to EPOS definition. Like it takes like one or two sentences to sort of say it uh, in, in this publication. Then what was done as an intervention? You've got to describe it very carefully with detail. Frequency, dosage, surgery, how much, when, exactly. Because this whole apples and oranges. If you're describing surgery, you would never just say sphenoethmoidectomy. You might want to say exactly or sinus surgery. You want to say exactly what was done in the sinus surgery. You can quote sometimes previous publications. So you can see here that what, um, the type of, type of external approach, we just, we just cited it according to a previous publication. That's sort of acceptable, unless it's very important for something. Um, we try to avoid bias. So, you know, we compared a nasal steroid with placebo. It's absolutely hopeless. You know, you'd say the participants were asked to apply a 15 milligram dose of mimetazone twice a day, but with a metered dose spray pump, and those in the control group, you know, had an identical looking sprays without the active compound. That's the sort of details. And then almost, you know, how many sprays they did. You can even include all that, you know, to make sure it was absolutely the same. And really here you're failing to state the dose or even what the placebo was. You know, because some people say, I've read, I've read studies where they say things like this, and then you find out, well, the placebo is actually a nasal irrigation. Huge volume nasal irrigation, and other people are putting sprays in. It's not exactly a placebo. How about this one? We, we measured how often GPs asked chronic sinus sinus patients that had asthma or, or smoked. Well, really, what has happened here is that the medical records were assessed and counted how many times smoking and asthma status had been recorded. Because a lot of the time, in the records, you don't actually make a comment about it. So there are lots of absentees. It assumes that medical records are 100% accurate. And so that's really important. We asked 100 CRS patients to complete a survey of quality of life. First of all, this is terrible because they're saying numbers in the methods. You know, you might say at one level it should be 147 CRS patients aged between this defined by ethos were approached and 100 completed, it's not 22, quality of life. And that's still wrong in my perspective, we'll talk about that, but it's failure to give specifics and recruitment bias, bias not declared. Because you can remember that of these, the 100 out of the 147 may be a skewed group. I mean, that's, you know, there's a lot of people who agreed not to give the questionnaire. Why didn't they give? They were angry, they didn't like their outcome, uh, they didn't uh, want to participate. Usually after you reach about 30% non-participation rate in, in, in questionnaire-based data, BMJ has this rule. If you get less than 70% return on your questionnaire, that's it, your, your manuscript's out. Because bias creeps in, and there's some studies to sort of show that. But big thing, you should never mention data in your methods. It should be a single number if you can help it in, in your methods. So whether how many patients were recruited, how many operations were done, all these things, none of this should ever appear in the methods. It's something that goes in the results. So, so this is results in methods, and it should really be adult CRS Caucasian patients, blah, 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 were approached to complete this NOT22 questionnaire. And then in the results, you start off by saying, 147 patients but were approached and 100%, 100 completed the questionnaire and here are their results, you know. And that's sort of how it often appears. Primary and secondary interventions, describe the tools. Was it a patient reported outcome or a surrogate marker? We'll go through this. Um, you know, sometimes you have a big sort of listy, wordy biochemical thing which you have to stick in sometimes and how you did some RCT study, that's sometimes. The other times when you're using questionnaires, you've got to make sure it's validated. Is there a retest test variability that's being tested? Is there an inter-rated variability? This is why we use things like in, cy in cyanonasal questionnaires like the SNOT-22, because they've been shown to be sensitive to change when patients report it and repeat it again. It's reliable. There's some external validity to other markers of that condition. 
and, you know, and that's externally is always toward the gold standard or some other measure of the disease. And it's sensitive to change, which is this big thing, that if you do it before and after an intervention and the patient actually says they feel better, that the questionnaire or the tool you're using can pick that up. And as such, there then must be a minimally clinically important difference in, in those studies. The other things that you should note on outcome is what we call the RAMBO. Is whether it's randomised um, allocation, um, uh, no, we'll, we'll just we'll talk about this. We'll talk about blinding. So whether it was blinded, whether like endoscopy, um, the endoscopy assessor, say in an endoscopic study, was blinded to the patient group. Did they know which patients had had this intervention and which didn't? Was it objective? You know, something like CT scan density is an objective study because you can measure it with Hounsfield units um, versus something that's um, qualitative. And then the statistical analysis, I just want to talk about these very, very quickly for statistics. Who here is comfortable doing their own statistics? Now we had a report. Most people. Okay, so I'm going to touch on something, and then you guys have to pick me up if you disagree on anything. First of all, in, a, in, a, in the results, you always describe the population as a whole. So you just give the N, the age, the gender, just gives them the basic data on your publication. If you've got two groups in a study, you must always give an allocation table at the very beginning. In randomised studies, you still need this, but it's assumed that the randomization process will make the two groups equal. But in mo everything else, case controls, cohorts, there's going to be some difference. So here's a study which was looking at saline versus genomycin irrigations in kids. This is the characteristics of the patients at the beginning of the trial. So anywhere where you have two groups, you must always have this allocation. And you just think of all the details. So whether they had asthma, allergy, where they came from, where they came from, I should say, um, their race, their age, their gender. You might have things like, you know, who were smokers, uh, who had previous radiotherapy, all the things you could imagine that might affect the outcome between the two groups. And you just give the baseline details. It's in, like, things like the strobe checklist will have this. But whenever you do two groups, you always have an allocation table, and then you just do a little p-value to compare the groups. Sure. That point, um, I think it might be meaning to describe non-parametric... Oh, we're going to come to that. We're going to, we're going to come to that. It's actually an erroneous um, table. But if you mean to describe a group of patients, or patients, and, and patients are very rarely representative of the normal population, unless you've got a very, very big number. And so these children have same and just might obviously for a reason, unless there's a control group, which I don't think there is a control group. But this should be medium. And that's a pet, pet uh, well, statistical... Well, what, you, mean, you mean the age group here? No. So when you're looking at... Um, which one? Uh, everything in this table should be... In, no, no, because they're all, they're all proportions. So this is actually not... They're not, they're not means. They're actually all just percentages. So right, mean plus or minus standard deviation. Uh, Use of variables summarized. So I think the only one they've got up here is age, which is fair enough. But, but good point. We're gonna, I'm going to come to that. I'm going to come to that. So, and you, you've got to describe dropouts. Why? And you've got to report complete data. So if people drop out and stuff, you know, you still just include them and you just say why they dropped out. Uh, and if you have something like, um, if it, all of a sudden in your results, you discuss the, the asthma status between groups. You can't just introduce asthma status in the results if you haven't defined what your definition of asthma was in the methods. So you can't suddenly just pull something out like a rabbit out of a hat in the results and suddenly have some variable like um, you know, asthma status. And asthma status differed between the two because in asthma status in results, if you put in the methods, you've got to say, what did I define as being asthmatic? Someone who has the symptoms of asthma? using an inhaled treatment re regularly, someone who's had, an, had a spirometry, someone who's had a spirometry with a bronchodilator challenge, a methacholine challenge. There's various levels in which asthma can be defined. It's okay to have different definitions, but you've at least got to define it in the method. So any variable that you use, like smoking status, does that mean they're active smokers? Smoking within the last 12 months? If they, if they quit three weeks before the study, does that make them an ex-smoker? You know, so these are sort things of you just have to define it. I'll give you an example of something that looks terrible. To make sure the author's not here. Okay. So this is because these are my, these are some of my these are some of my studies. So um, so this one is like one of those posters that that did get, um, that didn't get vetted before it was printed. 
Um, so this is someone looking at the impact of quality of life and skull-based surgery. The methods are so thin. I mean, everyone you see the methods. But all of a sudden, you've got things like nasal function score, you know, up here. And then you've got these other groups, dual resection, olfactory resection, radiotherapy. You know, none of these are defined here in the methods. The person reading this paper has no idea. And then this is my pet peeve. Just a whole lot of p-values in a table. I mean, it's a complete waste of time. It's absolutely, it's absolutely complete meaningless. So let's talk about outcome and data types. This is mm -hmm. things. I never had someone down when I was a trainee just tell me the, in, I'm going to do it in three minutes, the absolute basics of data. You only have three types of data. It's either scale or continuous. So scale and continuous data are units of measure where every unit relates the same to every other unit. So age is a good example, or weight, because it's in kilograms or in, in years. And the difference between 5 kilograms and 10 is the same as between 10 and 15. So this makes it a continuous or scale variable. They have inherently, as Alki said, because they all relate the same to each other, they have a spread. And when you have a spread, you then define it as being parametric or non-parametric, meaning is it normally distributed or is not. But in a publication, if you write mean and standard deviation of something, you are saying it's parametric. If it's non-parametric, then you report it as a median interquartile range. It's that simple. Would you agree? Yeah. You just... Yeah, normally just... And, you, and all you have to do is you do a histogram in your statistics program, and you, there are special tests for it. Yeah. Yep. But you can even just look at a histogram, and you can pick it. But it's got a little peak. It doesn't matter if the, if the skew is across. As long as there's a tail on either end, you, you're almost certainly going to have a parametric done. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me. I think that's just such a fundamental differentiation between the two data that you don't get it right in your data analysis as well. True. So it may, it may seem simple, but it's so fundamental that maybe you should go to the statistician, particularly about the format, where they can look at the meaning of the data. The and stuff. Yeah, the fact that very rare. Yeah, I don't disagree with that, and that's a good point. But uh, fortuitously, that's something you look at after the study's done, which is the only nice thing. At least you can go back and redo your stats if you got it wrong. But it's a very good. Let's have a look then at ordinal data. So ordinal data then, you don't have units to ordinal data. Ordinal data are just various categories, but the categories have a relation to each, to each other. They go increasing or decreasing arrangements. Good, better, best, terrific, poor. You know how they relate, but they're not necessarily in the same step up. So when someone says, I'm better to best, or better to excellent, there might be a much bigger jump than between good and better. And so it moves in one direction, the scale, but they're not the same relationships between the two. And then we have nominal data. So nominal data is just categories. Male, female, Caucasian, you know, their race, depends where you are. I'll give me another example. Uh, Nominal, uh, nominal data might be smokers, non-smokers. Dichotomous data is classically. They are unrelated groups. They are just defining the two groups. Okay. So when you present continuous data, you have to pick, is it parametric or non-parametric? It's parametric, and you have two groups. They are unrelated groups. So give me an example. If we took everyone in the room and we measured the weights of the people on the, my right-hand side of the room versus the weight of the people on, we're talking about body weight, on the left-hand side of the room, we would assume that weights are probably going to be normally distributed, or parametric, and that the people over here have no relationship to the people over here, so it's just a student's t-test. It's two unrelated groups. 
But if I sent this group away here now and had them go and chow, chow down outside and come back in an hour's time and redo their weights, I'm measuring the same group in two different points of time, and that's where you use a paired t-test. Does that make sense to everyone? Because you're repeating the result on the same group of people twice. And so everyone else, everyone in their group has two time points that relate to the same person. Whereas the other way, you're just comparing the distribution. When it's multiple groups, that's what an unrelated just do ANOVA between three or more groups. And if they relate to each other, so say we took the left-hand side of the room, we measured them first thing when they woke up in the morning, after breakfast, after lunch, after dinner, before they went to the toilet and then at bedtime, we would have a repeated measures and over because you're just measuring the same person throughout over time. Does that make sense? Okay. Continuous data then, this comes to Alki's point, uh, and a lot of it's non-parametric. So if you have two groups and it's non-parametric, they're unrelated, this is what a man Whitney U is. So a man Whitney U, just the same story. So if we had a look over here, let's think of a, a non-parametric. So if we asked everyone here their sense of nasal congestion at the moment in this slightly chilly room, um, you could give us a score. I'm sure that would probably be non-parametric. And we'd ask this group over here, same question, and we wanted to compare the scores, whether you're sitting closer to the vent or not closer to the vent, then this would be unrelated groups. If we took this group outside, we measured them now, put them in the hot weather, and asked them their congestion scores again, these are related groups, and this is what a Wilcoxon ring sum is. It's essentially, essentially the same as a paired. Multiple tests. Unrelated groups is what's called a Crookes or Wallace. It's just the ANOVA of non-parametric data. And then I actually didn't know what the related data was when I was doing this an hour ago. My academic colleagues, when you do non-parametric repeated tests, I have to look it up. <laughs> But that's the sort of, it's the structure of your mindset in going through it. This is what you're thinking, what is my data? Is it the same people being tested, different subjects? Let's talk about ordinal normal though. Because everything we talked about then was about continuous or scale data. Everything now that we're talking about is about proportions. The percentage of people who are smokers, non-smokers. The percentage female, non-female. These are tests of proportions. And everything is a percentage of the group. These are things that you never show in bar graphs. You don't use bar graphs and box plots and things to show percentages. I still see, I still see that I had one of my researchers change all their beautiful tables of percentages into a bar graph. This is me, it's almost gibberish. You know, these are percentages. Cross tables is what you use. So let's look at nominal. I'm going to do nominal first because it doesn't relate to each other. The classic nominal study is a chi-squared. And this is the sort of box that you develop in your head. So if you have presenting complaint between men and women, post-nasal drip, congestion and discharge. Three completely unrelated symptoms. They don't, not, one is not more worse than the other, it's not a scale. And if you said to me, I had a study of patients, how about in this room right now, say so how they feel, we just said, what are they, what's your, when you get a cold, what is your main complaint? And everyone would fit into one of these boxes and we would just get a percentage in every box. When you have a, a cross table of percentages, this is what a chi-squared is. And, that, and they are not related to each other. When you have an ordinal group though, you can use chi-squared, but the problem with chi-squared is that if you have a big long ordinal table, if you get one or two groups that just happen to be a high number, the chi-squared will be positive. But in, in essence, when you have an ordinal one, these actually mean something here. They actually, you know, normal is, is better than having a dysplastic mucosa, which is better still than having SCC in, si in situ, and then probably worse than SCC in situ is having frank SCC. You know, so to me, that's like an ordinal scale, but you can make that up. It could be a scale of uh, the severity of a symptom, none, mild, better, worse. What you want to see here is that not only do people fall into the boxes by more than chance alone, but they also fall in the direction of the scale itself as well. And that's why we use a Kendall's Tau B. So you just got to be careful about using a chi-squared for every box, cross table, because you want to show that it's not just, you, it actually is moving with the ordinal scale. Before we go to results, does anyone have any questions? That's like, I told you that was like five minutes. So the other thing is when we get multiple analyses being done, the other bit I would hate when they have one point or correction. Yes. And they pick out one or two details that are positive, and ignore all the rest when they're interested between them in the study. I think you don't correct that. Yeah.
you know, like this is like people who have huge cross table and they have like you know you, 30 different variables and they, they have like a couple that are that are positive and it's, it's like you know you don't know whether that's significant or not uh, whether it's just by chance alone because if you test more than 20 variables you're going to pick you're going to get one no so so cuz power though to me is not a problem for a type 1 error so type 1 error is where you get a statistically significant result from your study, but it is just by chance alone. That, you know, if you get a statistical significant result, I think you can report it. You don't have to worry about the power alone. But tell us the whole story about power is really a type 2. Example out there, so that, that's like um, that's picking a um, that's picking. So say you have a new intervention, so your new intervention for sinus surgery, like a balloon, and you do this balloon study, and you say that um, uh, you want to show that the balloon is as better or good than a significant um, operation, and, and you would look then at what's your quality of life improvement, it's not 22, you would want to know to achieve at least uh, a point, uh, you know, eight or score a number on a, it's not 22, is a minimal clinically significant difference, I need how many patients in my study. What people do then, they, they do 20 people on sinus surgery, 20 people on the balloon, and they show that there was no difference between the outcome. That is a complete waste of time because you're assuming that they're uh, comparable, but you never had enough patients in it to prove otherwise anyway, to at least the clinical significance. And, and I think the type 2 error, the equivalency study, is the biggest one. If you show something that there's no statistical difference between the two groups, that's when you've got to have sure what was your power to, to prove the difference. Yeah. Non-inferiority studies. Huge, and, and that, that's what. If you think something's going to be equivalent, or as good as something else, but not better, you need to really think about power, wouldn't you say, of that sort of study? So let's move on. So let's talk about very quickly about results. When you put results in, sometimes it's useful to put big tables in, <coughs> but you got. That's why we use graphs. So that's the same data, completely lost as a huge big table. But if you put it as a graph, it shows very nicely that one group stands out more than the other. And, and that's, that's why you use graphs. You want to use graphs to show an obvious difference. Um, there are some ways in which you, diagnostic studies often have these things called um, receiver-operator curves. It's how you work out the threshold for a test and how it gives different sensitivity <coughs> specificities. Um, Try not to duplicate text and graphs together. So you use them complementary. Don't don't just have them duplicating. So you know if you've got a um, if you've got a huge big box of you know numbers, which works very appropriate. Don't stick it all into the paragraph as well. And there are reporting standards of how you should lay out your results. For a meta-analysis, it's Prisma. For an RCT, it's cohorts. And of course, we talked then about um, for stroke now for other studies. Examples of this: when you report the results from a, uh, from a, a systematic review, you're supposed to show what's called a, a flow chart or a Prisma flow chart. When you report the results from from uh, from this systematic review, it's got a flow chart. But then, how you deliver the results from different RCTs is these forest plots. So, like a standard arrangement in which you might do things. And so, this is the sort of methods in which you do it in the discussion. You just want to say, how do these results compare? Compare with other data.
data, the limitations of interpretation, any hypothesis, extrapolation data. It doesn't have to, just try not to be too far-fetched. And the conclusions you make can only be based on the data that you present. So if you do a case series of my approach to medial max selectum, I have to use some rhinology here, and you can do it you know, quickly or simply, you can't say in your conclusions that uh, this technique of medial max selectomy is, is faster than you know, standard surgery. Because you haven't shown that. All you've shown is just the data for your technique. And that's all you can show. Unless you have a comparative group, you can't make comparative statements. So on that note, this, I, this is the thing about first person. I tolerate first person in articles really in the introduction only once, where we hypothesize something in the discussion only once where we speculate and really I try not to because they, they are personal or facts and I try very hard to limit the use of first person. I, I never place first person in the methods such as we did this or the results or we found that it's like not very scientific, that's where we try to have avoided. And this is at the bottom line, I, I dropped this from somewhere else and it said, look the whole age, you've got to get the grammar right. This is the sort of next level about you know making sure you get all the style right in writing, it should be very templated. And then the last thing, the nuance, is sort of putting your opinion into the whole thing. You should try to avoid this as much as possible. It should all be really dry, I think, scientific writing. Concise, small, you should make... I think a manuscript that can be 1,500 words or 2,000 words is excellent. Which means that you've got it down past really tight. Where to publish this, my last slide. You know, any, anyone from Australia, if you can't quite do it, you know, we've got a low backlog. What we don't take, though, is crap. It's not, it's not some you know, swill pile to dump everything else that doesn't get accepted in other journals. So we don't take case reports. I don't care how fascinating it was. You know, I'm, not, I'm not interested. And narrative reviews yeah, ain't likely to get in, you know, as it comes from someone very prestigious who wants to write on the current status or something. And, and on that note, that's the end of my talk. Anders, yeah, shoot, we've got some questions.